Our next session is titled Vigno 10 Years On, Learnings on the Social, Financial and Scientific Benefits of Old Vines in Maule in Chile. This is the, a research, the presentation of a research project which is funded by the IWSC, the International Wine and Spirits Competition, and undertaken by the Vigno team. So we're going to be joined shortly by Derek Mossman Knapp. Derek is a Toronto native. He came to Chile to ski, but stayed for love and wine. Together with his wife, Pilar Miranda, Derek co-founded Movi and also the Vigno Collective, which is all about reviving old vineyards with a focus on old vine carignan and regenerative farming to produce high quality wine and support local communities. As part of this project, they've also worked with Alvaro Peña, a noted professor of enology at the University of Chile and a very influential figure in the modern Chilean wine scene. He's known for blending his scientific and agronomic and enological rigor with a commitment to social and economic improvement. And he's a specialist in actually researching the composition of wine phenolics and impact on wine quality. Thanks to the generous support of the IWSC, which under the leadership of CEO Christelle Guibert supports and funds environmental research projects, including an annual grant to, the, to our organization, Derek and, and the team um, at the University of Chile were able to undertake an analytical piece of research looking at the last 10 years of Vigno and quantifying the, the learnings the challenges and the positive impacts of the Vigno project. So I am going to hand over now to Derek. We do have the full Vigno research project, which we will have up on the website and we'll be delighted to share with you. I should say I'm handing over to Derek and Pilar. Thank you, Derek, and over to you. I think you've got everything ready to, to share. Let me know if you need me to do anything. <laughs> Oh, the eternal refrain, you're on mute. <laughs> now, Qu quickly before I start sharing the presentation, I just want to say a quick, uh, I, I, uh, a very warm thank you to both Sarah and Belinda and to the IWSC for helping make all of this possible happen. Our Let pleasure. Just... Thank you. <laughs> Let me just share. And just if you can just give me the A-OK -okay that we're... Sharing, yes. Yes, you're good to go. Could you possibly do it on um slide on the on presenter view so that um that's it. Perfect. I will now mm -hmm. go quiet and let you and <laughs> let you talk us through the research. Thank you, Derek. Perfect. This is um Sausal in the Maule. Um we've put some um pictures in interspersed to give you a better feel for the place. Okay, well, the idea is to present a uh, vino. 10 years later, what have we learned? The first place, uh, we had a dedication to the viñadores of the Maule, Stuart, of the old vines for centuries, and the winemakers and viticulturists of vino stand upon their shoulders. Vigno, it's a group of a small, medium, and large producer in the Maule Valley in Southern Chile that came together in 2011 as a private DOC, like collective to promote the old vine Carignan of the Maule. How does Vigno work? Why does it work? How can others leverage what Vigno has learned for their own old vine collectives? We're gonna answer those questions and share a few ideas with you today. The full paper is a long read. Um, as Sarah just mentioned, it will be available. It is 70 plus pages. And there is a section of uh, surveys of the members of the collective, as well as critics and educators. Uh, there is a scientific piece that is much more elaborate than we're gonna, than we're gonna present here. 
And there is a financial analysis done by an MBA who did his thesis on Vino and kind of extended it and redirected it for the purposes of the study and brought it up to, to date. So what we've done here is <clears throat> we've put it, we've done a timeline interspersed with the comments and opinions of the partner members of the collective, creating a series of takeaways. Um, there were some secondary interviews and we've also included some opinions from cr the critics and educators. Then we've sussed up the uh, reduction of the key takeaways from the scientific study done the same from the financial piece, and we've interspersed pictures. The idea is to enthuse you all to- Put it in the context of the territory. And to read the larger report. In the surveys of the partner wineries, the final question put to them was, if a group here in Chile or abroad were thinking of forming a collective to promote their old vines, what advice would you give them? I think we even asked, what, what's the special sauce? So some of this will read a little funny because it's kind of, it's the way they've answered it, probably, most probably translated. So from the beginning here, more or less following a timeline, Vigno began as a lunch club of winemakers making old vine Carignan in 2009. That's part of why it worked. Be winemaker driven, not marketing driven. It lends authenticity and there is a benefit from the special relationship of winemaker with ownership. Again, this is textual. This is what the people said. The lion's share of work value was done and is still done by winemakers on volunteered time. Early on, the picture on the right here, early on the group hired an agency who did workshops on working and, deci and, and deciding together. One member remembers, positively I might add, being blindfolded and handed two suitcases before being asked a series of questions. In their words, this strange role-playing experience made a world of difference in how the group came together and made decisions moving forward. Now we tackle a tough one. In Spanish, we say asociatividad, and I suppose it's like all for one and one for all, but it's a little more complex than that we could say associativeness. Um, the, it's, it's the more selfless effort you put in. Um, the more you put in, the more you will get out. Um, we'll deal with elements of, yeah. uh, of, of uh, associativity as, as, as we move through here. Um, I'm gonna put a little picture in the bottom and we're just gonna take 30 seconds to explain that just before Vino came about, a group started in Chile called Movi, and it was the Movimiento de Viñeteros Independientes. I love to say it in Spanish because it sounds more Monty Python in Spanish than it does in English. And it was a group of small sellers trying to survive in the Chilean wine industry, as they call it, built by and for the large wineries. And I think it had an impact in creating this possibility. But what we must remember is that, unlike Movi, Vino was not a rebellion. The, the challenge and the strength, ultimately, of Vino is the coexistence of small, medium, and large wineries working together. Okay, uh, Vino become an uh, AG in 2011. So AG is Association Gremial. Like a Gremial Association, if you can translate. Um, and a few ideas that we, we thought when, when Vino was created or officially created was keep it simple. The traditional DOC from the world often do not. So the idea for us was keep some flexibility, um, put some rules at the same time, uh, focus on what is unique and niche, niche sales, and is more resilient in a downturn. Yes. In the, um, in the morning, somebody was talking about the niche, if this differential point or not, and that can open a discussion later. Keep it simple, transparent governance and structure, keep overhead low. Lots of volunteer time, that is very, very important that everyone 
want uh, and 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 it's possible to put some time on free for all the group. Uh, one partner vote that was very important. So every partner member must enter and play by the same transparency rules. That sounds very simple, but most of the wines of the world have weight put on the larger sellers. And in the case of Vino, when it first began, I believe it was Pablo Morandé, when he was asked, shouldn't the larger sellers have more power? He, he simply asked everyone how many cases of specifically Carignan they were producing. And it turned out that the smaller sellers were producing more. So he smiled and said, well, we'll give the little guys more votes then. And that was that. We became one is one, one each. Um, here the, the 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 press begins. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to continue with the with the partners' um, recommendations. The special sauce. Be prepared for the world not to be prepared, and for the neighbors not to be prepared too. Whilst Vigna was not a rebellion, there was resistance on the road. The wines were um, misfits that came from where the bulk business boomed. And many of the time felt it was not good for Chile to put this particular foot forward. Um, before we heard of workhorse grapes, I think there's similar um, situations in, in, in different places. On critics, the partners have suggested that some critics, tasters, and educators naturally gravitate toward the opportunity to taste an outlier ensemble of wines from a specific origin versus tasting wine brand portfolios, but, but some don't. And some will, but only once. Wine educators wanted to fit the wines into their traditional map where new world old vines did not exist. Learn to work with them, help them to discover. Vigno made a strategic decision to stake out old vine territory, despite these traditional boundaries imposed upon it. By doing this, they enabled the academy to see wine through an approach that centers on discovery, rather than the historical hierarchy or status quo. Um, I think one of the more interesting ones here was, um, was Flowers in the Pavement that was published on the Wine Advocate that created a bit of a stir because in the end it was, instead of the Chile report, there was a second report on these other collectives that had begun that was not seen as such a positive thing. I think in the long run, it has been a very positive thing, but at the time, we weren't exactly prepared for that. I'll keep going. First, to build a category of old vine wines together. Second, everyone get busy filling that category. It turns out this is far more effective method to sell every winery's wines than to surf the wave individually. Note, everyone must be able and willing to sell everyone's wines as if they were their own. Do this and tastings will lead to more tastings and opportunities to more opportunities. When time has passed and the smoke has cleared, you will, all of you, realize more cases of wine have shipped. Part of the reason the sharing worked for Vigno was it was practiced on the farm as well as on the road with journalists. And that's the picture on, on the right here. That there was a sharing that I think was more and more accepted, but but at the time it was odd to share. How do we say um, company secrets or uh, you know, but, but to All experience and... and and it really was practiced in a way. And again, the winemakers led the way. Make clearly make clear technical rules to allow the all vines wines to the level in a cogent critical mass. The subregion of Mali shown through, and probably in your areas, they're gonna happen the same thing. Like their own subregions gonna speak and talk about themselves. I think the picture on the right is indicative that if you're used to tasting um, brand portfolios, when you see sixteen wines in a row, all themes. How do you see sub themes on on a similar theme? I, I, it's just very appetizing to me anyway attractive yeah um it is very effective when the group tastes together with outsiders um in in four short years you see how that the press was indeed interested uh the will to work together that characterizes Mino is markedly different from 
the individualistic modus operandi that is all too common in the Chilean wine business and perhaps elsewhere. Remember, the words of partners speaking. Yeah. Visiting each other's farms helped make the group classy. A study needed to be done openly with data share with the partners and beyond. A completed study was done and published in 1617 uh, with a characterization from the, all the areas where the vineyard were producing with the climate, detail, soils, and other factors. So that was at the very in the beginning when the group was established. We, we, we thought it was very, very important to come with all this technical information. It was a very big book, very large pages. I think yeah. impressed because of its not size. Traveling size. Not sure how many took it home in a in a in a carry on. In 2018, there was the official certification of the vineyards that was done by the University of Talca as like a, like an independent third party. 2019, we hosted an international um, Carignan conference. Morgan Twain Peterson came down. Kelly White. There was some wonderful sharing of ideas. Um, in the classroom, as it were, and on the farm. The final one here, very specific. Uh, it says, every partner should rotate through the, red, the directory. Remember, we're 16, so it's more than possible. Any partner that begins to complain should be included on the next directory selection. When members participate in the volunteer directory, they respect the process because they know the process firsthand. Yeah, focusing on what is unique and niche, there is no need to conform to the mainstream, not to a brand. Get your wines onto the syllabus of the course of work for uh, WZ, MW, and Master of Psalms. They are an important part of your region, all wine story. Be prepared to work for what you believe in. Organize as a group to get your wines in front of the monopoly. That's very interesting, like Sweden, Norway, Ontario. They will recognize a collective of wines and work to have them make a call just for your group wines. And Vigno, it's being uh, called a couple of times for, for that um, opportunity of business. And that is very important because you are in the radar of them. Don't forget the home front, but don't necessarily start there. I think Chile is a very specific situation. Um, we envy tremendously the sellers in, in California, for example, that can sell out of the cellar door. So obviously conditions are different um, depending on where you are in the world. Prepare for envy from the mainstream. Be prepared for envy from the mainstream. Your local wines of insert wherever you are from, will not necessarily understand your collective at first. Help them to understand it. The more selfless effort you put in, the more you will get out. And here they, someone says, think greater good and you will sell a greater number of cases and eventually even make greater wine. On the left here, you have um, our, a yearly tasting that we do with various um, uh, critics, uh, Joaquin from Binus in this case, and there's like a rolling out of the same vintage of all of the producers, I suppose somewhat like en primeur in a, in a, in a far off way. And the idea is a rolling out of a new vintage in front of uh, the press each year. And on the right is a uh, save the date for a conference that's coming up in November. And some pictures. Yeah, the idea you, you have a a short travel to south of Chile with the people and the land. Okay, the rules of the road of Vigno. Established in 2011, Vigno is a private DOC like collective. So you can see in the right the location of the area. We are like 3, 000, uh, 300 kilometers south from Santiago, the capital in a small area of uh, Maule, in three specific areas. That's on the dark green on the right, okay? So that's the territory. And the rules that we're developing with the group was 80% um, of uh, Carignan grapes minimum, uh, 30 years old minimum, uh, the age of the plants, dry farm, and the rest of the land must comply with the above rules and points. 
Okay, so we consider the bias grafter on all roots of pi are accepted too, and consider to have the age of their roots. At least they have to be age for two years before the release. Uh, doesn't matter in which um, uh, a material you have the, the wine, their eggs, cements, tinajas, barrels, depending on the winemaker style. And also, and very important, we have a certification. So we have a farm are certified by a local university. And also we have a rules for the labeling that everyone has to complain. And we are everyone uh, under the Vino um, brand or collective brand. So takeaways from the surveys conducted with the partner wineries. Um, some of the examples, some of the, just some of the questions, a lot more in the study, obviously. Uh, the partners felt that there was a greater impact in the image of Maui than in the commercial part. Um, I guess they want more commercial success in the future. And they felt that there was a greater impact in the improvement of the vineyards than there was in the improvement of the, the farmers um, helping to farm them more work ahead again. We asked where the fruit had come from and where it was coming from today and had that changed. And today, the uh, there's very, there's only only one on annual contract, um, several own their own vineyard, and most are purchasing a long-term contract and participating um, actively, proactively in the farming of the fruit. We asked about pricing and pricing had gone up for everyone, Some for some not, not so much, and for others, 75% um, and, and more than 100%. Um, percent. Touchy question we asked about whether we should become a legal DOC one day and all but one said yes to our surprise. Takeaways, um, some a few takeaways from the uh, critics and educators. We asked in the beginning what the, their vision was of old vines 10 or 15 years ago, Carignan and non-Carignan. And there was the the words that I suppose we all expected, um, potential and uh, rustic. Um, someone remembered uh, a specific someone's petrol pump red. Um, obviously, this has uh, changed um, and changed positively. When we ask about regions of the world, interestingly, Maui is obviously first on their hand. We're asking the questions, but there were many mentions of old vines in the new world, which I think is a recurring theme. Also from the critics and educator, they they themselves came up with more than just Bino for them. It was Bino, Movi, and Chanchos, des, chanchos Deslinguados, pigs without a tongue, are the natural wine. They're really fairs more than a group, but I suppose they have created the essence of a group over the um, over the years. Had they changed the vision of uh, Chile? Absolutely, more vibrant. They changed the stereotype. They'd made Chilean wine more attractive. They said that Movi had a cohesive philosophy, that Vino was an appellation, um, and that this model of Vino should, should um, others should follow it and it should be applied in other regions. They said uh, that they made Chile exciting, distinctive, sexy, and more desirable. Binyu contributes to a stronger stylistic diversity. And um, that these groups logically start as ideas and then materialize in associations and, and or events. But behind them, there's a strong idealism that borders on the positive, takes them beyond inertia. Um, what else do we have here? This was coming coming out of the subsequent um, interviews. And there was a couple of interviews about how old is old and how frail is old. And I guess what more than one of the interview was trying to get across was that some people hold this idea that all old vines are fragile and frail. And they said that no, some Kerenyana, to say nothing of Pais, not, not, not so frail. Um, Vines well taken care of can be far more robust than many people think. The far on the farms where vines are proactively being revived, regenerative agriculture. I think there's some common themes here. They mentioned specifically during the wet season when they're trying to straighten rows so that um, the plowing by horse can can be what it once was. And they talked about how these plants in in the wet ground can be twisted and turned. 
how dead wood is cold so that the vines grow back to be thick again. And this was, they insisted that, that, that um, extranjeros, the people from outside saw this as surprising and odd. They also mentioned the case of a couple of vineyards that were burned very badly in our um, bushfires of 2017, where the plant above the ground was, was, was burned, the vineyard was burned badly, but that the root, the, the, how do you say, the life force of the root structure was so strong that new shoots came up and literally used the old charred trunk as support and continued to um, live. What one pulled upon was the, the life experience of 70, 80, 100 plus years, apparently serving them uh, to confront the extreme weather of modern times. They kind of mentioned the this this the, how do you say the, the sequia the drought of the last few years is kind of nothing compared to 38 and 39. Um, there were there were some interesting interviews on the winemaking style of vino. Um, no one likes to talk about the olden times, but the few who did mentioned that in the beginning of the Renaissance of Carignan and the Maule, the winemakers were still applying kind of a style of, of extraction in small barriques that was very popular at the time, and that. Once the group had formed and there was more sharing amongst the group, this style was very short-lived and that Carignans today um, are crafted to showcase the fruit in the vineyard sites. Um, no one really likes to talk about the, the, the moniker of natural commercial wines, but obviously working with Carignana with, um, with higher acidity, it's possible to make wines with less um, intervention. And that one of the beauties someone insists upon of the old vines was the, the, the lignified respond or stems. And that this made for um, uh, wonderful use in the uh, in the fermenters. Is this still me? Yes. One of the changes in the history that I thought was very interesting is when we speak of Chile, we normally talk about the the you, if you if you'd done a history of Canyan when the group was formed, or even five or six years ago, you would have talked about the introduction in early days and the the the, the, the proliferation and when. The, the French varieties come as part of um, the culture of the late 1800s. And then you would then have jumped to earthquake recovery after 1939, because the, the earthquake of 2010 resonated with that of 1939, and they were, became like bookends in the beginning of the presentation of Vigno. And what's come out in, in the work that historians have done in the meantime is that between 1900 and 1924, there's a group of, of Catalans, not French. Um, some of you may know of the, the, these names in the, in the Chilean wine business. And that what they were doing is by train, they were bringing up um, Pais, Senso, Mocatel, Crenian um, from the south and bottling it in the south of Santiago. And that this was, um, this was a booming um, business. Obviously, then these things went into decline and neglect as the uh, the modern kind of say new world um, Bordeaux related varieties came out, and then ninety five to um, sorry two thousand five two thousand and ten is the how do you say as uh, Carignan begins its its revival as a as a solo artist. Yeah, um, like an inspiration though from from Vigno, um, there are another group that uh, appear like a copycat collective, and it's Al Maule that's appearing in twenty twenty one, and is part by some members of Vigno, and they're focused on all by producers of the oldest grape variety in America, in Chile that's Pais, um, and the yeah they they were based in a few ideas of Moby, um, thinking in in some regulations to work by themselves. So Vigno. Um, Vigno, so Vigno, Vigno. sorry. <laughs> so Vigno. So the idea is you have at least 90% or more from a uh, Pais variety uh, working with all vines at least three years old, a uh, dry farming, all bushes. Um, and the idea is uh, incorporate not just the medium or small company, also the growers um, from the area in in Maule and probably you'll see also um in a few minutes that is part of the financial analysis that maybe this um Bino association could be very interesting to replicate in different areas like a model someone else used the phrase piggyback 
I, I suppose we could say that instead of co co copycat. Okay, focusing the in the science part of the of the study, we we're gonna try to focus just in three drivers: that is consistency, diversity, and typicity. This part of um, of the project was uh, done uh, by Alvaro Peña, that, like um, Sarah said, that's um, a professor at the University of Chile. Okay, about consistency, uh, regardless of the zone, Chilean Carignan wines have high acidity and color intensity and a very, very good uh, tannin structure that ensures for good aging and for that reason also um, recommended at least two years in the bottle before release to give it more roundness and complexity in the wines, okay? So the idea in the graphics, uh, you see uh, different areas where vineyards are made, so South Sal, Melo Sal, but in general, they're around, uh, around the 3, 3.3 pH. The acidity and sulfuric acid express is around between 4 and 5.5, 5, so it's quite high. And the study was analyzing wines from the three different um, vintages, so it's 12, 14, 21, and the idea is keep some information for the uh, for the vintage 23 in the future. About uh, diversity, uh, independently of the common aspect of the vineyards or the wine, uh, the magnitude and intensity of their chemical composition, composition change in each subzone, which contribute to the sensory diversity. So there are line through that you can identify in the vineyard wines but also these specific areas give you some diversity. And this on the graphic that the is explained or show uh, the, the different amount of different compounds like ester, terpenes, aldehydes. Okay, so when you can identify the group of vino, the Carignan is made in the, in the Maule, but also you are uh, gonna find a special um, or different wine from every uh, sub area. Yeah, so consistent, more detail, diversity becomes personality. And we think that is very, very important. About typicity, um, the idea was a study Carignan from France, Spain, and Italy. And the, these wines were recommended for, for partners in, in those different three countries. And they have a chemical composition that contribute to a sensory typicity that differentiate them from other Carignan wines in the world. So if you follow the, the, the yellow line, you can see uh, more different the Chilean Carignans than the European Carignans. If you um, put attention to persistency, in typicity, and acidity, so you can see that more uh, the European wines come um, they have a behave that is more similar than the Chilean Carignan. And more pictures. Not all of the wines, but some of the wines are really up on the Cordillera de la Costa or coastal mountains, Chile's other mountains, original mountains. Thank you. Derek and Pilar. Wait, we've got we've got a few yes. more. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> okay, the business portion. I shall be brief. Um, his original thesis was that Chilean wine trade did not provide the Chilean wine trade did not provide enough structure. So for over thirty years, a box has cost less than thirty dollars. He was fascinated by vino costing four times the average price, having tremendous critical recognition, having consolidated a collective brand. And between the 16 vineyards, having a production of around 60,000 cases, including domestic production. Now, doesn't sound like very much, but if we were to analyze how much Chilean wine sells for $110 plus per case, okay. suddenly that's a very interesting number. Um, just quickly, one of the in most interesting things what, that this MBA financial numbers banker guy um, communicated to me as he was doing this was, that in his original thesis, he was he was he was hell bent that the Cabernets of the Maipo and the uh, how do you say the Cabernet of Pelmo should be doing this. And when he realized what was going on with the old bank conference, 
he really saw a connection between these kind of um, lesser known underdog old vines in regions lesser known as doing, as applying this kind of collective um, thinking. Here on the right, you have the pricing of wines with mention of Reserva Gran Reserva and wines without versus Vino, shown two ways in the graph that you really see how Vino kind of flies um, above. Another thing I thought was interesting that the financial person explained was, and uh, one of the, the educator uh, critics said that there's no lead, need to limit production in old vines because there's natural lower yields. So it kind of makes for a comfortable way to make, a uh, how do you say, a, a, an inherent DOC. And another thing he said that I thought was most interesting was that someone insisted that just because wines are old, they could be mediocre. It, he didn't really understand this. He said, from a strict financial perspective, if an old vineyard is good, how do you say, if someone's bothered to take care of it so long, it, it can't be mediocre. And in his words, he said, if the vineyard not produced great fruit and from this great wine, it would have been replaced by kiwis 30 years ago, blueberries 20 years ago, or cherries 10 years ago. I thought it was a very pragmatic thing. And to end on the on the business piece, he, uh, he, he spoke of niches. And he said it's uh, a niche can be a better investment than a less than differentiated share of mainstream. And he said in, in today's world of business, the 70 or 80 years it takes for a vineyard to grow is a rather high barrier to entry. I'm going to skip over and we're going to finish finish up here. So the take the overall takeaways would be beginning with the Societividad that we spoke of, the working together to create a category. Consistent, detailed diversity becomes personality. And I just ended with what I just said about the, the barrier to entry. And with that, we'd just like to say thank you again, IWSC, um, Sarah and Belinda, and um, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, and to, of course, all of your um, compatriots in the Vino Collective. I thought that the comment about the kind of kindred spirits coming together was really interesting. And certainly this uh, underdog and elevating of an apparently workhorse variety is something that we saw in parallels with South Africa. And, and what was most interesting is he insisted that that was as a banker, like as a financial numbers guru, yeah. that's where he saw the future, which I, I thought was interesting. It wasn't at the heart yes. of the head. No. So I think that this is another way in for old, that we, in which we can learn from old vines in how we think about categories and value and storytelling and of truthful stories around wine quality. The, the full research project, again, thank you to IWSC for their support and allowing us to undertake this kind of research. I put it into the chat. I just wanted to highlight that I know that within that, project within that piece of research, you highlight that the collective branding has led to significantly higher grape prices and improved vineyard management, particularly for small scale farmers who struggled in this complete wild hinterland really of Maui. So this is really significant work. It's doing good. It's making great wine. So thank you. I do have a couple of questions which we just need to answer quickly because we're running okay a little behind the time. So one of them is from Angela Lloyd. Do the children of these 16 producers equally buy into what you have achieved? The children? The, the, the children of the 16, the, 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 the next generation. I think that Angela is getting at, do you think this, this collaboration will continue? Y yes, but I think that really does have to be defined because it has to, at some point, it has to be, how do we say, professionalized, that I think it will always depend on a certain amount of volunteering time, but I think it has to be professionalized. And I think there we've learned, working with the larger companies, how to make it work, how to cross that generational gap. It's very interesting, the idea of generations, because I think it more than just for us or in Vino, the next generation is a very large challenge. For when every old vines. Because in these communities, a lot of children would sooner go to town. They would sooner go to the city. And how do you make people want to stay on the land, come back to the land, or go to the land to do this? Yeah. 
Um, there are a couple of very well, more more challenging questions um, from Aldearo and Dean Lepan, challenging the assertion that just because someone has taken care of a vineyard for decades, it means that it's good or great. Plenty of good, plenty of old vineyards are used to make mediocre wines. Agreed. Conversely, there are some, uh, you know, almost neglected, forgotten vineyards um, that were previously planted for distillation, whose kind of benign neglect is now being restored. I think that's a big question. If you don't yes. mind, Elder and Dean, I'm not putting you off. Happy to pick up on that, but just so that we can keep on schedule for this um, for this day of the conference. Let me come back to you on that. And I think that's probably a whole session on its own. Um, and uh, so thank you. Thank you to Pilar I, and Derek. I hope we get to put the wines out when we have a presential, or how do we say that? Yes. An in-person in conference, wherever in the world that is. Yes. Watch this space. So thank you so much. We're now moving on.